Good morning. My name is Laura Cantwell with AARP Florida. Thank you so much for joining us today for the uh, H-Friendly Sharing Symposium series. This is our second session and uh, this is called Creating Age-Friendly Community and Health and Well-Being. We had a session last week. If you're interested in viewing that, it is available online on YouTube. Uh, as a reminder, this will also be recorded live so that you can go back and watch or share the link. Uh, so I want to get us started today. And we're going to be using a little bit of interactive polling uh, during, uh, during the session. So if you have a cell phone uh, or pull up another web brow browser, uh, we're going to do a test run to get us started. Uh, you go to pollev.com and the username is friendly. So I'll give everybody just a minute. Okay, and the directions are still at the top of your screen. As a reminder, go to pollev.com and then the username is the word friendly and then just click join. And if you could, all right, we got some responses already. So we're just trying to get a feel for who's here today. Who are you representing today? You can say a community, uh, an organization, a city, uh, or you can just say you are representing uh, your neighborhood, your community, yourself. So we're getting some good comments in. Uh, as a reminder, the poll everywhere does better with one word or hyphenate it to put those words together. So I see we have Sarasota County, Miami-Dade, Pinellas, uh, Pembroke Pines, Tallahassee, Miami-Dade really representing Sarasota. State Unit on Aging. We have a coalition with us. Oh my goodness, this is exciting. And as you can see, as we start doing this, if you're on your cell phone, you can add graphics too. Um, and we're gonna be utilizing this throughout our presentations. So um, you can just keep this logged in. And when we get to our next question, it'll be ready to go so that you can type in your answer there. How oh, we have Dunedin, Ocala, Ocala Marion, Marion Senior Services, Gainesville, Martin County, Broward County, Indian River, Fort Lauderdale. Okay, awesome. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I want to introduce our panelists that are here. Uh, we have, uh, that's gonna be joining us for session two, uh, Megan Wolf, who is the Senior Development Manager for Trust for America's Health. We are so pleased to have us, her join us today, as well as Ryan Mims, who is the Chief Health Strategist for the Florida Department of Health in Walton County, uh, Kristen Griffiths, the Chief Executive Officer for Elder Options, and Jennifer Martinez, Executive Director for Marion Services. Uh, to kind of give you a little bit of housekeeping of how this is going to go today, we will have our presentations, uh, we'll do a little bit of polling, and then we will also have an opportunity to hear from the panelists. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started with Megan. Megan, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Laura. It's really great to uh, to be with you all. Good morning. Um, really, th thank you so much for inviting me to participate in your sharing symposium today. I'm excited to provide you with some of the history of the Florida Age-Friendly Public Health System Initiative. And you could go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, and then where we are today. And you'll hear a great example of the age-friendly public health system work in Florida from Ryan um, right after me. So for those of you who don't know us, Trust for America's Health or TIFA is a public health policy research and advocacy nonprofit in DC focused on improving the conditions for health nationally so that every community and every person has the opportunity for optimal health and well-being. Some of the issues that we focus on include emergency preparedness, public health funding and infrastructure, obesity and nutrition, 
substance use, and suicide and the health impacts of climate change. Healthy aging has been a relatively new area for TIFA, uh, about three and a half years now, uh, but we've been really gratified with the response from public health across the country in embracing this work. Um, so I'm going to start today with uh, just kind of a, a description of the origin of this work, including the five C's framework that you see on the right side of the slide here, the connecting, coordinating, collecting, communicating, and complementing. We consider those the, the five C's or roles of public health in aging. I'm going to talk about the Florida pilot and the efforts of the county health departments in our learning and action network. And you can see depicted on the map there, the original counties in the network, as well as talk a little bit um, and just recognize the contributions of our Florida Advisory Committee. Next slide, please. So our initiative began with the convening in 2017. And some of you um, on, on the call, I know we're, we're at that convening in 2017 and included public health, the aging services sector, healthcare and academic representatives where two questions were considered. Does public health have a role to play in healthy aging? And if so, would the aging network welcome public health engagement? Among the participants in this convening, there was a strong consensus in the affirmative. The result of that convening became our framework for creating age-friendly public health systems and, and the, the framework that you saw on the previous slide, and we call that the five C's framework. The next step was the launch of the initiative with a pilot in Florida, working directly with 37 of Florida's 67 county health departments that all committed to becoming age-friendly public health systems. We also helped to facilitate a new collaboration between the Department of Health and the Department of Elder Affairs that resulted in the creation of the Aging in Florida profiles for all 67 counties that exists and, and kind of sits now within the Florida health charts system. So I want to be sure and uh, recognize our advisory committee for age-friendly public health in Florida that includes Laura Cantwell, uh, Kathy Black from the University of South Florida, Chuck Henry, the health officer for Sarasota, Secretary Prudham of the Department of Elder Affairs, Michelle Branham from the Alzheimer's Association, and many other illustrious Floridians who continue to lead and provide guidance and expertise to our age-friendly public health system efforts. The 37 county health departments each developed a vision for their jurisdictions as well as action plans focused on the priority areas that they identified unique to their communities and that the public health staff could get started on right away. We facilitated in-person convenings, um, uh, learning opportunities that you can see depicted on that photo here um, to explore more deeply the public health opportunities for engaging in older adult health and to allow for some networking among uh, county health department staff and leadership across the state. Next slide, please. So over an 18 month period, the 37 county health departments in the network have identified 13 actions or activities that we have categorized according to the five C's. Most of these activities have not required additional staff or funding, but still reflect truly meaningful changes toward creating age-friendly public health systems. Uh, we have captured actions, all of these actions um, in these categories in our Florida summary report that's avail available on our age-friendly public health system website. And I'll provide that link at the end of my presentation. Next slide. I wanna take a quick look and give you uh, just kind of a snapshot of, of what happened and some of the changes that happened across the state and, and within these 37 county health departments. Um, so you can see from these activities, some of the steps um, that are, are you know, maybe pretty basic and maybe seem um, relatively easy, um, but they are also sustainable. And most of these activities are ongoing today. So just in terms of the C of complementing and supplementing existing uh, services, you can see that the Collier County Health Department implemented um, a healthy aging and parks program and provided physical activity prescriptions through uh, healthcare providers to increase physical activity among older adults. And then Martin County Health Department created a new preparedness kit for older adults to be distributed through the Medical Reserve Corps in the community. So each of these, um, each of these little snapshots for each of the five C's uh, identifies the different county health departments that, um, it, that completed action or initiated activities in this particular category or indicator. 
And on our summary report, there is a one page snapshot of each one of the county health departments. So I encourage you to, to go there and, uh, and take a look at the amazing work that, that has happened across the state. Next slide, please. So now we have entered into phase two of our work with new funding from the John A. Hartford Foundation. Um, and our phase two activities include um, the, we created a new age-friendly public health system recognition program that I'm going to talk about a little bit in a few slides down a little bit uh, in a couple of minutes. Um, and then we are expanding age-friendly public health system to include more county health departments through our mentor-mentee opportunity. Uh, we are working with the Department of Health to deepen the aging and profile um, look at health equity to help all the county health departments uh, do a, a deeper dive and, and further address the um, health disparities that may exist in their communities. And then we are going to work to strengthen the public health response to social isolation. And to do that, we are going to be planning a social isolation summit uh, that will happen hopefully early next year. Next slide, please. So our mentor mentee opportunity was launched um, earlier this summer. Uh, we uh, uh, provided this opportunity to all of the current uh, Learning in Action Network County Health Departments. And we ended up, um, you can see the list of mentors on the left side of this chart and the mentees that are the new County Health Departments that are now included in our Learning in Action Network. And we're really excited that we were able to provide many grants to both the mentors and the mentees to help support this work. And if we'll go to the next slide, you can see some of the activities that, uh, that these new county health department collaborations will be engaging in. Um, one of course is just to meet regularly so they can learn from one another. But we're, we're asking the mentors to coach the mentees in developing those crucial partnerships with their aging and community, community organization, uh, community CBOs that actually you know, can work in the field and work directly with older adults. Um, to explore how to use the aging in Florida profiles, um, different opportunities for using that data and sharing it. Uh, and to engage with the age-friendly ecosystem, including age-friendly communities, age-friendly health systems, um, and the uh, dementia-friendly communities. And I know uh, Florida has an amazing um, uh, uh, dementia care program as well. We also encourage, are encouraging all the mentor and mentee county health departments to participate in the monthly trainings that we provide as part of our recognition program. These are um, trainings that happen every third Thursday at 3 p.m. So we have one next week. Um, and these, uh, these have been really uh, well received and provide an opportunity to increase the capacity for health departments and health, health department staff to develop expertise in certain issues and areas. And then of course, uh, participating in our recognition program. So uh, the mentor mentee work has been launched. These um, uh, staff are beginning to meet together and develop action plans and visions and, and move this work forward in these new communities. Next slide, please. So this is what the map of Florida looks like now with, um, with the, the increase of the nine new county health departments. And you can see that we're covering now about 75% of the state. So we're very excited and very proud of all the work that's happened um, in Florida. And, um, and I just want to say that, uh, you know, based on the success of the Florida pilot and all the amazing work that has been done by the county health departments, there is now a strong national movement in age-friendly public health systems. TIFA is working directly, not just with Florida, but also now in Michigan, Mississippi, New York, Washington, and Colorado, and Georgia as well. We're doing a, a separate project in Georgia. We also work closely with the US Department of Health and Human Services to facilitate their healthy aging efforts. Uh, and yesterday was the first day of a national healthy aging symposium. Today will be the second day from one to, to six um, where we are focusing on the social determinants of health as a framework, but hearing from uh, national leaders across the country in healthy aging. And then uh, TIFA is also working closely with CDC's new healthy aging branch and our advocacy um, uh, team are working to advocate for uh, robust funding for CDC to support every state in age-friendly public health. 
Um, and, and lastly, we worked with the Public Health Accreditation Board to identify recommendations for including healthy aging within the public health accreditation standards and measures. Um, that process is underway. We hope that those recommendations will be included in the new standards and measures that will be released next year. Uh, next slide, please. So I just wanted to, uh, to just give a, a brief uh, um, look at our recognition program. Our vision at TIFA is that every state, local, territorial, and tribal health department will prioritize older adult health as a core function. And so we have developed this recognition program that we hope will incentivize this work. Um, the recognition requires completion of 10 action steps that we believe don't require additional staff or funding. Um, and we provide training and um, uh, you know, access to all of our resources for health department staff to accomplish this work. So far in Florida, we have Alachua, Marion, Sarasota, and Santa Rosa who have enrolled in the program. And uh, we're looking forward to working with all of the mentor and mentee county health departments as well to join these first four. We only have one uh, health department that has achieved recognition so far, and that is the New York State Department of Health. So we're hoping that one of the county health departments in Florida will be the first local health department to achieve recognition. And we look forward to promoting that, uh, that event when it happens. And we're hoping that will happen very soon. So next slide, that ends my formal presentation and I will look forward to answering questions alongside with, uh, with Ryan. And um, you can see my contact information on this slide, TIFA's website and our Age Friendly Public Health System website as well. So welcome you all to take full advantage of those resources. Thanks, Laura. Again, thank you so, so much for coming on today and sharing this and the great work that's happening in Florida. Uh, and uh, now nationally. So again, if you have questions for Megan, um, please put them in the Q&A. We're going to come back in a few minutes and take some uh, time to hear uh, from Megan and Ryan together uh, to answer some questions. So thank you, Megan. Um, now we're going to hear from Ryan Mims uh, to hear a little bit about what he's been doing in Walton County. Ryan. Thank you, Laura, and thank you, Megan. Uh, you kind of set the, the framework of what uh, I'm gonna be talking about today. A lot of this work came from that pilot project that with Trust for America's Health in collaboration with the Florida Department of Health. Uh, I really appreciate um, us having a focus on the, the needs and the health of older adults. Uh, and I'm gonna be talking about how, an example of how we can incorporate the age-friendly work into already is, is existing partnerships um, with the Florida Department of Health or any public health system. So again, uh, my name is Ryan Mims. Um, I'm the age-friendly Walton facilitator. Uh, I don't like to call myself a lead because really our partners lead the program and I just kind of make sure that we're heading into um, a direction and uh, achieving the set of goals that we have. Um, I wanna say that Walton County, uh, we're. Uh, it's founded on our partnership and our amazing partners. Um, they are the foundation of how we uh, are able to do some of the work uh, related to age-friendly um, activities. Uh, we can't do it without them. So we're really appreciative, um, definitely for a county like Walton County, where we're um, kind of smaller uh, in size um, and we have some resource restrictions. Um, it, it, we have to have some synergy and some alignment in order to make sure we're um, meeting the needs, and we're uh, working towards the goal of health equity, uh, making sure that um, we, you know, we are working to make uh, meet the needs and the desires of everyone in the community, and making sure that they are living, uh, have the ability to live a long, healthy life. Um, so, uh, next slide. A little bit about Walton County. Um, some of y'all might not know exactly where it is. We we are a smaller county. Uh, our population estimate um, as of 2019 is about 75,000, uh, about 74,000, 70, it's, it's right at 75,000. Um, our population change though um, in the last decade was 34.6%. Uh, uh, we are one of the fastest growing counties in the United States, um, the fastest growing county by population um, change in the state of Florida. Uh, and a lot of that um, change is when in that older adult population. Um, we're seeing more individuals coming to our amazing beaches uh, and, and to, we're a tourist destination and they're wanting to stay. 
Uh, and uh, you can see that 43% of our population um, is individuals age 50 and older. Um, and last year, um, during the pandemic, we had over 4 million um, visitors in our county. So uh, that is just a testament that we are a tourist destination. Uh, we appreciate our visitors coming. Uh, and, um, but we, are, we have some restrictions and some um, barriers um, when it comes to looking at a forward strategic plan of growth in our community, when it comes to infrastructure, when it comes to meeting the needs of the most vulnerable, the most at-risk populations. Um, next slide. So, uh, like I said, some this work kind of started with Trust for America's Health's um, pilot project. Uh, and this kind of came from it in May 2019, Walton County joined the AARP network of age-friendly uh, states and communities. So I'm uh, really um, appreciative of our Florida County commissioners and our partners of driving this, um, including us in um, the, the network to make sure that we can uh, proper, pro properly align with um, that project and with everything else and, uh, and making this a priority. Uh, very appreciative of that. So it kind of it kind of started there um, locally at our in our county. Um, next slide. So like I said, alignment is key uh, when it comes to adding age friendly work in, uh, into our into the local public health system um, partnerships that's already formed. Uh, it, it specifically, uh, we aligned with our Department of Health and Walton County strategic plan. We included age friendly. Um, objectives in, in our strategic plan to make sure that it was well supported. Um, in addition, our local public health system is called the Walton Community Health Improvement Partnership or WCHIP. I will um, use the, the acronym WCHIP going forward. It's, it's a mouthful, uh, but uh, WCHIP is, um, is our partnership here locally that has uh, about 40 to 50 different um, organizations and community volunteers um, that are working towards making Walton County a healthier place to live, learn, work, play, and uh, worship. So it's, uh, that, that partnership is key. And uh, we included a lot of age-friendly uh, strategies and objectives into that partnerships plan. Um, and then that's how we are, we are able to support the age-friendly work. It wasn't really additional work. Um, that we are that we had to do. Uh, we already was doing a lot of the work beforehand. It was just making sure that we are taking into account the needs of older adults whenever we are doing assessments and doing um, planning and making sure that the right partners are at the table. Um, next slide. So uh, these are our WCHIP partners. Um, we have everybody from um, local government to uh, you know, nonprofit organizations, United Way to local media. Uh, we have partners from across the lifespan. So individuals that focus on prenatal um, all the way up to uh, home health and hospice. Um, we really wanna make sure that everybody has um, a, a stake uh, at the, in a seat at the table when we're talking about what we need to do to improve uh, the health of individuals in Walton County. Um, and this partnership is key. Like I said, we have um, almost 50 partners um, and it's ever growing. Um, we're, we have a, a meeting next week um, and we we're inviting 10 new partners to be at the meeting. So it, it's slowly catching on. Um, this work has been done um, for the past 10 years um, for the Department of Health, um, some longer than that, some counties, but we in Walton County, we've been kind of working with this CHIP, uh, WCHIP, partnership for the last 10 years. And so it's not something that happened overnight. It was already an established partnership that we had these connections with, but really looking at the, the needs of older adults and making that a purpose uh, in, of the partnership um, just really strengthened the relationships that we already had. Um, so next slide. And this is key, and this is from the AARP Livability Index, is that when we plan for older adults, we plan for everyone. Um, so just adding in, you know, older adults wasn't really any additional work that, you know, that we had to do uh, because we should be planning for everyone um, and, and especially the at-risk populations that are, um, that are, you know, have health disparities and things that we need to look into a little closer um, and make strategies to improve the health of those individuals. So 
like I said, it's not really additional work. It was already kind of the foundation was already there. And we, it was just kind of a, a new lens to look through our process with. Um, next slide. So with the community health improvement pro, um, plan, uh, we use a process called MAP, which is mobilizing for action through planning and partnerships. Um, every county uses this um, process and every county has a, a, a community health improvement plan. So um, this is a requirement through our uh, public health accreditation board, our accreditation of, uh, of being a health department. Um, so it's important for us to have, utilize that um, mobilizing through action, through planning and partnerships. Um, I just wanted to show that really there wasn't there, it, it kind of aligns perfectly. Um, it's both of them are cycles. Uh, both of them has a planning um, stage, an implemented implementation stage, and then an evaluation stage, like most health education and um, programs uh, planning. So it really wasn't any additional work. It was just um, uh, an additional lens, like I said. So uh, they align perfectly. So it's, it, it really worked for us. Next slide. And through the AAR, AARP, um, Age-Friendly Communities and States, um, it really hits home as the eight domains of livability. That's one of the key foundations of that, um, the, that initiative. And really um, looking into them, we, we try to incorporate each, uh, each of the um, domains within our uh, assessments and, and with the, within our plan. So, um, those are the, I think they'll be talked about a little bit later. So uh, next, next slide. So in 2019, uh, we completed our community health assessment. That's kind of the first stage or first step of the process um, of creating a plan is doing assessments. And we really want to he hear the, the voice of older adults. We utilize partnerships with our Council on Aging, our Northwest Florida Area Agency on Aging, um, our partners with Home Health, um, we utilize a lot of our partners that are within the aging sector to make sure that um, they, that especially individuals that are going into homes for older adults or serve older adults. Um, and they were uh, incredible with trying to get, uh, you know, individuals to do surveys for us to actually hear. Uh, we also did key informant interviews of individuals in the community, and that also helped kind of form our plan. So. Um, the top community issues that we saw in the older adult population, um, affordable and accessible housing, crime, and education. Um, education being education about healthy behaviors, um, not specifically like um, K through 12 education. Uh, it was more about, you know, education of what they can do to be healthier. Um, top unhealthy behaviors in the community, they say to drug use, um, unsafe driving, and uh, being overweight or obese. So, um, out of that, we kind of started um, utilizing uh, what the input was given and then to create a plan. So next page, next page, next slide. Um, so within our community health improvement plan, uh, which is a three-year plan that started in 2020 uh, and will end next year, and then we'll go through the process again. Uh, we have four um, kind of priorities and those are healthy homes, healthy people, healthy places and healthy behaviors. So affordable housing is a need in our county. Um, that's one of the infrastructure kind of um, constraints that we're feeling, uh, especially for individuals that are low income or workforce. So we, so that's one of the things we want to make sure we focus on that. One of the ways that we uh, made sure that we aligned uh, correctly is making sure that we use language like older adults and uh, across the lifespan for some of our goals and objectives. Um, to make sure that there was clear uh, focus on aging populations. So uh, I'll go over some of the things that we've done for each of these uh, in the next slide. So next slide. Uh, for healthy homes uh, in 2019, 2020, we entered the um, Housing and Health Action Learning Network, which was a, a network from the National Association of Counties in alignment with the um, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, so this was a project that selected about, I think, six counties in the in the United States, and uh, we were one of the six that uh, was able to talk and um, learn from other counties that had uh, similar issues. Um, this was, of course, kind of um, hijacked a little bit, um, refocused because of COVID-19, 
Um, and then we started talking about how the pandemic started influencing and um, causing issues within our populations that are, were homeless and um, were already kind of um, having housing issues and how it was just amplified because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so this was something that we kind of focused on and we partnered with our county, uh, Walton County, Board of County Commissioners and our planning departments in trying to um, just open up the discussion, again, facilitate. Um, we, we're not out there building homes in public health. We are there to facilitate and, and provide some evidence-based, um, hopefully improvements and some um, activities that can be implemented by our local government. So uh, that was kind of our role. And we opened up how housing influences health and, and how it's important to keep in a community healthy. Um, so it was a great partnership in opening that conversation up. Another thing is that we have a, um, a, a program called Communities and Transformation in our county. Uh, it is uh, facilitated by our Caring and Sharing of South Walton. Uh, and annually, they host a uh, cost of poverty experience starting in 2019, um, based on some of the, the work that we started with, uh, with our opening up that conversation. And we have, you know, volunteers um, through our partnership with, you know, older adult um, sector is plugged into that to make sure that we um, are targeting and people are realizing the needs of older adults in our community. Uh, also, we had a focus on uh, in enhancing our homeless management information system. Uh, at the beginning of our community health improvement plan back in 2019, we only had a couple of agencies involved um, in putting input into the system. Um, through our Homelessness and Housing Alliance, that got um, more focus and more partners um, that serve, um, you know, uh, those experiencing poverty and home, uh, homeless or at, uh, at risk of ex experiencing homelessness um, has uh, really enhanced this um, system. And I think we have almost, almost 20 partners involved with it when we only have like three at the beginning of the plan. So it was important for us to, um, to kind of enhance that in order sh to show that we're coordinating our resources correctly and as a small county. Next slide. Um, when it comes to uh, healthy places, the other priority, um, we have a, uh, a focus on parks um, as a chronic disease prevention strategy. Uh, one of the things that we did back uh, earlier this year, we partnered with our uh, sheriff's office and, and um, our uh, cultural alliance and uh, cultural arts alliance and um, uh, some HOAs to enhance a, a park that were, was repeatedly getting graffitied. Um, that had high um, questions around, um, that had high uh, issues with uh, crime. So we, uh, we uh, the sheriff's office came up with a strategy on uh, making parks more of a centerpiece of um, showing a thriving community. So we did this art in the park where uh, we worked with students in a local high school uh, and uh, art students, and they designed murals for some of the walls in the parks. Uh, and um, it, we brought community partners together uh, and we started painting the murals with the kids. Um, really that intergenerational uh, um, uh, you know, activity, it was really great. Um, this is a, a, a project that we're, is continuing. So we're kind of working on enhancing that and going to other parks. Uh, we did a local parks assessment in the summer uh, with an intern out of uh, Emory University. And she went and did a photo voice assessment with some of our parks. Uh, we looked at things like accessibility, um, looks at, look at things like shade and other needs for parks um, that creates a par create parks as a um, place that people uh, want to go and represents the community and making sure that everyone can actually enjoy parks. Um, so that local parks assessment kind of leads into our next, um, our next objective uh, around multi-generational parks. Uh, we have a set criteria around uh, what, you know, what kind of makes a multi-generational park. And we are using that um, assessment to see what parks um, meet the criteria, which parks are um, right there at it, and which parks you kind of need to focus. And we've talked to our um, local governments around uh, making a standard for parks going forward. Um, we see that um, some parks in some, some parts of the county um, might get more attention than other parts of the county. Um, so having a kind of a set baseline of what a park actually looks like and, and feels like is um, kind of what we're working on. So we currently have 
um, three parks that are that meet the criteria for the multi-generational park. Um, so we're kind of moving forward with that and making parks more um, visible and making them available and uh, for every everybody regardless of age or ability. So next slide. Um, something that we're currently working on and we've kind of put pieces together um, because COVID-19, um, the pandemic re response really um, set, um, it, it showed the importance of our faith-based communities uh, and also why we need to have a better connection with them. Uh, but that was kind of already established uh, previously of that and it just was uh, kind of more amplified because of the COVID-19 response. Um, so we are currently working with uh, our faith, faith communities um, specifically, we're um, and kicking off an initiative um, later this month um, with the local Baptist Association. Um, and we're really, uh, it is a chronic disease prevention strategy, um, evidence-based program through the um, University of Florida IFAS Extension Office. Uh, and we are um, kicking it off and uh, we have the support from the entire Baptist Association within our county. Um, and so that's something that we're trying to build more into. We're kind of piloting of this. Hopefully, eventually, um, we'll get to a point where we maybe can have more in-person, um, in-person kind of programs that we were able to go out to churches with. Um, this initial program is a web-based um, program, so uh, working with the churches on uh, making sure it's easy for older adults to access and, um, and those that might have digital literacy issues. Uh, we really want to make sure that's an issue uh, focus. So that's something that we're working on currently. Next slide. Um, another thing is food insecurity in our county. Um, United Way uh, came up, uh, received a grant to do these little food pantries in our county. And we partnered with a retired uh, professional that helped put these in um, and get agreements with specific locations in our county that we felt like that we're either in a food desert or we felt like older adults um, could easily access. Uh, we have one at our health department uh, main location here in Dubuniac to help, um, you know, work on food insecurity uh, and address that with our client, our patient population. Um, so this is something that we've been working on. We have 10 set up across the county um, and we're looking for more locations. So this has been great. Um, in a sustainable um, project um, through United Way. Uh, another is the annual peanut butter drive that our uh, IFAS office, uh, University of Florida IFAS office kind of focuses on. Uh, we made, we, it was a, um, it's a, a, several counties do it and the peanut butter that you raise goes to local um, food pantries. Uh, so that it's a, it's a good project to, um, work with workplaces and other in, in faith-based communities and trying to make sure that um, the things that we raise goes back to our local uh, communities. And then we, we've we been utilizing our 211 system um, for multiple things, but one is still link families to food and to food help. Um, so um, that's one of the things that we have really focused on and having a centralized communication strategy on where to send people whenever they're needing uh, assistance with stuff. So. Uh, next slide. Uh, with Around Healthy People, we have a focus on injury prevention, um, specifically uh, fall prevention and motor vehicle crash prevention. Uh, we completed a survey uh, with home health hospice, long-term care facility rehabs, um, and a lot of other age-friendly partners on what, um, what eight fall prevention program um, tools they use at their place. Um, uh, some have been, some of the larger um, companies that are more networked um, has some, but some of the smaller ones didn't um, and they couldn't stay. So the goal was to, uh, and is to um, identify a best practice that we can share with, um, with the ones that don't have any um, and, so, and have that kind of best uh, evidence-based best practice sharing um, locally. Uh, we have a partnership with Fire and EMS for them to go out to do home checks for falls. Um, if anybody, we've been, that's a new program that we just implemented um, last month. Uh, really appreciative of our fire rescue and EMS um, um, EMTs and paramedics that they're willing to go out um, and, and assist older adults and those that might be at fall risk to make sure that their homes are safe. Um, another is our West Florida Air Area Health Education um, Center. 
Um, they have a Tai Chi and a Matter of Balance programs um, that they do at our senior centers. And we've been helping, um, you know, helping support that as much as we can. Uh, back in 2019, uh, we worked with uh, Kindred uh, at home um, to do a virtual dementia tour uh, for, our, for our staff, but also the community and, all, and specifically our special needs shelter staff um, that staffs that during a hurricane or a natural disaster. Um, that was successful and um, they, they kind of got the experience what it is like whenever you're losing some of those motor abilities um, and, and vision and all of that. So that was great. Uh, motor vehicle crash prevention is something that we promoted through AARP's car fit program. Um, and we kind of aligned that with the free tax ass assistance program that we have through our uh, one or a couple of our partners, including our council on aging, um, that we were able to promote the virtual options because theirs aren't uh, in person uh, right now because of COVID. Um, but there were virtual options that we were able to promote with the older adults. Next slide. And I've said this word <laughs> COVID-19 pandemic uh, several times. So of course that kind of influenced the last year and a half of what we were able to do and why partnerships are so important. Uh, we um, noticeably found that those already formed partnerships in the aging sector was extremely vital in trying to get messaging out and, and to older adults and helping educate older adults on precautions and, and strategies they can take in order to stay healthy. Um, so it's, it's extremely important. Um, this just kind of emphasized the importance of it um, during, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it, it really, um, our, our focus in public health went straight to uh, meeting the needs of the pandemic. So our partners were really the ones that were able to push through um, a lot of the, what, what, we are, we, what we talked about previously, a lot of the strategies that we already laid out with uh, older adults. Um, so uh, this didn't happen overnight, this forming of partnerships, of course, is a, is a process, but it's extremely important to start that as soon as possible and to get those connections early. Next slide. Um, and then Healthy Behaviors is our last work group. Um, we worked on safe medication disposal. Uh, we established new disposal sites throughout the county, and we promote that um, through uh, various means. Um, but we, we really worked with um, our local healthcare providers on making sure that educating older adults on safe disposal options of their medications, um, if um, they're needing especially opioids and those that um, might be um, at risk uh, of getting, falling into the wrong hands. Uh, we also have the substance use and mental health resource list that we update and we work with 211 and our other partners to update that to make sure that we are uh, aware of what's in our community and in our surrounding areas of what is what is available because we are a small county that has limited resources. Uh, we want to make sure we're aware of what's actually out there and what areas that we need to focus in on um, to get more into it. And tobacco cessation, of course, um, we are working with our um, health educators uh, and our partners that um, host classes to, for tobacco cessation and has the, uh, the ability to offer um, individuals and, and working with our providers, healthcare providers, and linking people to cessation options. Um, next slide. And again, my name is Ryan Mims. I work for the Florida Department of Health in Walton County. Um, my, that's my email and that's my phone number. If anybody has any additional questions or anything that's more specific, I'll hang around and do the panel, but uh, that's it. Ryan, thank you so much. This is incredible to see all of the work that's happening in Walton County. Thank you so much for sharing your journey in the county uh, with all the work that you're doing and how you're connecting with Age Friendly. We're going to take a minute to do a poll and then Ryan, Megan, um, I invite you to, to join us after we finish our polls and Dr. Kathy Black. Uh, for a panel discussion. So as we start the poll, um, if anybody uh, has a question, start thinking about it so we can get that queued up. Uh, but for right now, please pull out your phone again or your web browser uh, to participate in our poll everywhere. And you'll see that it's now turned, okay, great. Uh, it's turned to an ABC format. So uh, please go ahead and put in your answer and I'll give that just a minute.
So, wow, we've had quite a few people that have participated in their health improvement planning for your community. After hearing both of your presentations, we definitely have some people that have not and are interested in learning more. Um, so we'll be giving them lots of resources. All right. Okay, I'm going to close this one out and move to our next poll question. Okay, in one word, so if give your phone or your, your um, screen just a second to catch up, and in one word, what does an age-friendly health system mean to you? And as this is being developed, uh, Dr. Kathy Black, if you wouldn't mind uh, putting your camera back on and joining us as well. Great. I'm responding to the poll, Laura. <laughs> I'm <laughs> multitasking. Mm. We have Kathy joining us today. As Megan Wolf mentioned, she participated uh, in the process of the Age Friendly Public Health Systems pilot and also uh, participated in Sarasota County closely with the Department of Health there as well and uh, has uh, been helping us with communities across Florida work on their age friendly work. So, Kathy, thank you so much for joining us. And look at this poll. I, I mean, this is collaboration, equity, independence, all coming forward. And boy, did Ryan's presentation illustrate all of that. And um, thank you also to uh, Tifa uh, and Megan Wolf for really providing this model that so well aligns with the age-friendly community movement. And so um, Ryan, for communities, um, that have an age-friendly community but have not yet connected, um, whether their county ha is already participating, what would you recommend? So every county has a community health improvement plan, like I said. So um, I would uh, encourage individuals to reach out to their health department um, and to see who the community health improvement um, planner is and, and just link up to them. Just say, hey, we're interested in um, being a part of your partnership because every county has a partnership. And again, alignment is key. We, we don't want to duplicate efforts. We want to create synergy around an issue, an issue in the community and to, um, you know, reduce barriers to make sure that older adults are um, included in the everyone in our community. Um, and that's important. So yeah, reach out to your county health department. Uh, we're here to, uh, to help the community and help the, help the citizens and our partners um, you know, help people be healthy. Yeah. Megan, do you have any other suggestions on connecting the two movements? So, you know, it's the most important thing that we found is that you need a champion. You know, you just need one person or a couple of people who are really committed to this work, who can catch the vision and, and share that passion uh, with others in the community. So I, I think that's the most important thing. I, I agree with Ryan, you know, find, find your coalition in your community, um, reach out to, uh, you know, to, to whatever that coalition is, a commission on aging, um, you know, the, the county health department, um, there, you know, there, is, there, is, there are a lot of little moving parts and pieces uh, to the age-friendly ecosystem. And um, that it just takes, you know, one person really in, in a community to start bringing those parts and pieces together. Yeah, Ryan, you, you, didn't, you, you didn't refer to yourself as a leader. However, you are a leader. Yes. And we greatly appreciate your leadership. And uh, Megan, I think that's an excellent advice uh, for everybody. And I can't help but notice um, that the health department, because of the aligned work and the health assessment and the health improvement planning, which is very much aligned with the age-friendly work on, on uh, assessment and action planning, um, sharing those um, metrics that benefit those participating organizations and that are benefiting. Uh, any suggestions on how to better uh, sell those pieces so that people realize they're getting so much out of this engagement? I mean, a key thing that we do is we ask what those metrics are for those organizations um, because we can, I mean, there are general metrics that we use, you know, um, length of life, uh, it, it issues with, you know, diseases that affect older adults, um, but every agency has different metrics. So. Um, you know, starting that off of having a clear vision, um, a clear kind of goal for what we're trying to do, 
and then opening up that communication of like, what do we need to do in order to make this successful? Um, and make sure everybody gets their piece that they need to, you know, take back to their organization. And, and you know, that's, that's the whole point of it. And everyone has, you know, those metrics, those important pieces, but uh, opening up that communication is key and seeing, you know, which ones, um, you know, you take some from this, you know, one from this agency one and just kind of, you put it together and then that's how you kind of create your, uh, the data that you keep annually, you know, update whenever you can uh, routinely. So um, that's, that, that would be my, that's what we've done in order to, and to keep your partners engaged, like you said, to sell them on the vision uh, and to make sure that, you know, we're all working together. And I think it's so important, Ryan, because you're talking about, you know, those relationships, don't, it's not just a one-time meeting and the aging network bringing such incredibly strong relationships to all of this. And of course, public health always being responsive and we've all been, you know, sidelined, but nobody more than public health. And Megan, what do you see as you look at the nation as far as um, it's actually those opportunities have created even more uh, uh, application to the age friendly work um, because of COVID and the pandemic. What are some of the things you've seen at the national level? Um, so there is there is a huge recognition now that public health has you know such obvious roles to play to address the health and well being of our older adults. So we've seen that as a result of the pandemic, um, and it's just it has opened eyes. Um, and yet there are still gaps. You know there are gaps in care. There are gaps in data that that we're working to try and address. Um, but the the partnerships, as Ryan you know described, the partnerships between public health and the aging network where they exist have made that pandemic response so much more efficient and so much more productive. Um, that those are the things we're trying to highlight and and we're trying to gather those kind of bright spots across the country. Um, of where that's happening. So Ryan, I appreciate hearing you say that as well, because I think that um, it just helps to bolster the, um, the cause for public health to, to engage and to help align the, all the age-friendly work, with, which public health does you know, so well and bringing the you know, multi-sector stakeholders together. So that, that's what we're beginning to see. And, and I particularly love how um, there's an increasing focus on those social determinants and those earlier touch points in which we can affect those later health outcomes. And uh, it's, we, see, we saw that throughout the work, Ryan. So we really particularly love that. Any other suggestions on addressing health equity, Ryan? You, you really need to hear the voice of uh, the, pe the people that you're trying to help. I mean, uh, feedback is so important with our planning. We can guess what the issues are, and what the barriers are, but really, if you don't get the input from the individuals that you're trying to help, and um, you know, it's going to be useless. So, um, and it'll be a lot harder. Uh, so, make sure that you are, you know, reaching out to age-friendly, uh, age aging sector partners to make sure that they're helping enhance and get feedback um, and to the actual end users of you know what we're trying to do. Um, that's ultimately, you know, health equity is so important and, um, and we, there's so many, like, um, you know, it's, there's so much more that we can do. Um, and there's so much, you know, we are, we're not, we've solved, we haven't solved many of the problems, none of the problems, really. Uh, everything is about improving, um, and, you know, where, where we are currently into a better place. And ultimately the aspiration of health equity um, is, you know, what we strive for, uh, but we're never there. So there's always something that we can do um, to um, be better, to improve, um, and to make sure that everybody has what they need to live a healthy life. That's, that's the ultimate goal. Um, and not just a healthy life, a happy life, a thriving life, a life that um, they're proud of, that they're uh, proud of the community in which they live. Um, you know, that's, that's the goal. Um, so um, yeah, making sure that you're hearing the, the, the end user's input. And I know, Ryan, um, uh, Megan is leaving us in just a moment yes. here. And I just want to, uh, last comment, Megan, uh, this is a lot of information and there's a lot of things happening, not just throughout Florida, but throughout the nation. Can you direct people to uh, where the resources are in age-friendly public health so that the public health departments can do even more? 
Sure, yeah, please visit our website, www.afphs.org. That's Age Friendly Public Health System. Um, and feel free to reach out to me directly, mwolf, W-O-L-F-E, at tifa.org. Happy to respond and, um, and help you know, get people engaged and supported. Megan, thank you so much. I wanted to add, we did have a question about that in the comments about the different counties that are participating in the pilot. So if you go to that website, you can see a list of the counties um, which are ranging from smaller to larger, larger metros across Florida. Um, I had one question for you before we wrap up. Now that you've entered your phase two pilot here in Florida with a mentor mentee, uh, how long is that uh, pilot going to, or that project going to be lasting with that relationship? So that's going to go through um, early 2023, actually, mm -hmm. um, which is the, the term of our current grant with the Johnny Harker Foundation. So we'll be supporting counties. And, you know, it's a, the participation in Age Friendly Public Health System, our Learning and Action Network is purely voluntary. Uh, but every county that enrolls in a recognition program, we will consider them as part of the Learning and Action Network. So uh, hope that that everyone will, you know, will jump on board. Great. Thank you so much. I Thank really appreciate so it. And I also, one more comment, the CarFit program uh, is going to go online, Ryan, I know you're mentioning that. Uh, it's online right now, but we'll, we'll, we'll return in person in 2022. Um, thank you so much, Ryan. Thank you so much for Megan, who had to leave us uh, at 11. Uh, and now we're going to head into our next set of presentations. So next up, we have Kristen Griffiths, who is the Chief Executive Op Officer at Elder Options. Kristen, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start your presentation. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm so honored to be here today with this distinguished panel and to have the opportunity to share the experience um, that and what we're working towards the goal of creating a dementia um, and age-friendly communities. You're gonna hear from me this morning, but you're also gonna hear from Jennifer Martinez with Marion Senior Services after me. Um, and she's going to give you a really good perspective of what's going on in Marion County. Elder Options serves as the Area Agency on Aging and the Aging and Disability Resource Center for 16 counties in North Central Florida. But in each of our counties, we have a really close partner, our lead agencies, where we work to um, closely to achieve the goals of the age-friendly initiatives and the goals of the Dementia Care and Cure Initiative. Um, so we're gonna discuss some of the wonderful achievements that we have accomplished in North um, Central Florida. And I'm gonna be focusing today on some of the successes we've had with our um, Dementia Care and Cure Initiative, especially during the um, pandemic. And then Jennifer's gonna focus on her age-friendly initiative in Marion County. But I would be remiss not to mention the work in Alachua County and what they have done. I've been, a, and Elder Options has been a part of that. Uh, it, it really resembles a lot of what Ryan was just talking about and um, what's going on in Walton County where we worked very closely with the um, uh, Lodge County Health Department and their contact, Courtney Oliver, and have really um, built a really strong relationship in Alachua County with the Aging Network and the Health Department and have had a lot of successes there on that age-friendly initiative. But um, anyways, I, I will focus today on the Dementia Care and Cure Initiative. And as I said, um, Jennifer Martinez will talk a little bit about what she's doing in Marion County for age-friendly. Uh, so next slide. So um, the Dementia Care and Care Initiative in response to the increasing incidence of dementia, um, the Dementia Care and Care Initiative was announced by the Department of Elder Affairs. It is a statewide effort um, and it seeks to make the state of Florida dementia friendly, um, take an action to support those diagnosed with dementia, their families and their caregivers, and, and which in turn creates a community that's not only dementia friendly, but is also age friendly. So I'll go into a little bit about how I feel these really complement each other um, as we've had them active in our area, both of the initiatives. So next slide. So I, I'm a visual person and I like to look at graphics. So I put the two graphics next to each other um, that we see many times when we're looking at the age-friendly initiative and then the dementia um, caring communities and really gives an idea of how they complement each other. Uh, these initiatives do focus on creating community collaborations to address the needs, not only of Florida's rapidly growing population, but also really focusing on how we can make these communities uh, livable for all ages. So all ages can thrive and live a high quality life. Um, and what's important is you'll see the areas where there's great synergy is they both focus very strongly on education, uh, community supports, 
research, uh, promoting health and uh, wellness, and making sure that the community provides opportunities for social participation um, for everyone, and that's the, including those living and uh, caring, living with dementia or caring with, for someone with dementia. Uh, we feel very strongly in our area that these cannot or should not operate in silos. Um, you'll see many times that the participants that um, are active on our Dementia Care and Cure Initiative and Task Force or on our Education um, Committee also are very active in participating on the Age Friendly Task Force. So they definitely should never operate in silos as they complement each other and um, really uh, accomplish in many times the same goal. Uh, what I love both, like I love, what I love most about both of the initiatives is that they really focus on collaboration and looking locally um, on how to you can address your community's needs, um, and I think that's very important um, to keep it very local. Uh, next slide. So this slide um, uh, shows you uh, the designated age-friendly communities, but also where the Dementia Care and Care Task Force are. Um, if you're joining today and your community is not listed here, I would highly recommend working with your partners in your community to, forget, to begin the process. Maybe start with one, um, but I really feel strongly that because they're complement each other so well that it's something that the community could look at um, having both initiatives as you're working on one. Um, it just really works good to um, meld into the other one. So, uh, and then again, as you see, you'll see in North Central Florida that we have um, the, uh, in Alachua County where the D DCCI task force, but we're also an age-friendly county. Um, Marion County, as you'll hear from again from Jenny, is an age-friendly county, but she is looking at possibly working on creating her own dementia care and care initiative. Um, when I say that, obviously our one in Alachua County covers more than one county. So a dementia care and cure initiative task force can actually operate as large or as small as um, it works for those communities. But sometimes it works well to, um, to have another county pick it up and, and we look to support Jenny in the future as she, um, Jennifer Martinez and Marion Senior Services as they look to implement that. So next slide. So some notable achievements. And when I was asked to speak today, um, it was really around how did we keep our Dementia Care and Cure Initiative Task Force operating and how um, strongly through the pandemic. And I really wanted to focus on some of the main reasons why we truly believe it, it was um, it, it is operating so well. And that is the first one, a strong partnership and a very shared responsibility between us, Elder Options, the Area Agency on Aging, um, and our Memory Disorder Clinic that's located at the University of Florida. Um, uh, the two chairs, we have somebody in our office, Johnny Jones, who's our um, caregiver support coordinator, and um, Jana Unilowski, who's the coordinator of the Memory Disorder Clinic, and they work very closely um, chairing and co-chairing this. And it brings a strong sense of ownership to both parties, but also importantly, it widens the audience that we can reach. We feel that's a, a very key component to your dementia care and cure initiative, not having one of the partners um, kind of carrying the load. Uh, and we really have a great partnership and, and really um, appreciate the work um, that both parties do. We also focused a good portion of time on training and education. We have a training committee that we've got started. Uh, we are really working on alternative ways to provide the training. Um, education modules are available to each community to add and tailor for their communities. Um, as I said earlier, we're actually covering a larger area. We're not just in Alachua County, so we have small rural communities that um, look to um, address it and um, tailor it to the needs of their community versus what might be going on in the city of Gainesville or Ocala. Um, and then we can add them to existing training education modules. So we really worked with some that already had education and um, onboarding education for their um, maybe law enforcement officers where they've integrated it in. Uh, and it can be altered for time constraints. So we can make it as long or as short as needed. Um, we're making sure that we're still covering the content adequately. Um, and then, you know, we have some successes just recently through the pandemic. We um, have the video version of the training that's been um, utilized, but also we did an in-person training with Marion County Sheriff's Office. Again, this will show you how um, our Dementia Care and Care Initiative still does um, operate in Marion County. Um, uh, and that, that was a very successful, um, very successful training, and we were happy to do that. Um, so the next thing I'll talk about, um, and we can just move to the next slide, is the RAC card. So another thing that we uh, felt was important and we heard from our partners was that they wanted something that was just really simple that we could explain kind of what is this 
Dementia Care and Care Initiative? What are you trying to achieve? And then kind of give you some, um, you know, some information on dementia and, you know, understanding it, what are the signs, um, and of course, resources, you know, that if somebody picks the rack card up in the community and says, okay, this is something where, you know, I think, um, you know, I may need more information. We've got resources available. So these have been really, really um, appreciated by our partners and getting those out. So next slide. So a few other things um, that we feel like, um, and going back to saying the pandemic came, and <laughs> I think all of us know that uh, when last March we had to pivot very quickly, you know, how are we going to respond to this? We were really concerned about some of our task force. Uh, how are they going to, were they going to be successful in this new virtual environment? And we were actually pleasantly surprised that it had the opposite effect on attendance. So we have actually seen our attendance go up with the virtual option. Uh, which we'll want to continue to um, allow because I think it's just been more convenient for some of the partners to be able to attend. We also started something that we thought was very innovative and in that we were um, allowing each of the partners or any of the members on the task force members to come and do a monthly presentation. And it really started to get uh, more engagement within the partners, uh, not just of us bringing an agenda to them, but for them to each have a time to learn from each other. And it really has helped, we thought, with attendance. Um, it's interesting that to note that at two o'clock today, we have one of our Dementia Care and Care Initiative uh, Task Force meetings. And um, we're you know, um, looking forward to having a presentation uh, from the newest uh, member at the Department of Elder Affairs and their new dementia care coordinator. So we're very excited about that today. And I'm sure we'll have good attendance. We've been averaging about um, 20, and that may not sound great for larger areas, metropolitan areas, um, Miamis and Orlandos, but for um, North Central Florida, 20 average has been pretty good for us. And we're, we're very happy with that. Um, but important, more importantly, I feel like, is the participation. And uh, we really have some notable partners that we think are very um, important in our community to be part of the task force to make sure that we can really make systemic change in the community. And that is our major goal. So we have um, the Gainesville Fire and Rescue and the Gainesville Police Department very active. Our two major hospital systems, UF Health, um, is very active in our uh, North Florida Regional Medical Center. So. We feel like that is a very important component to success is being sure the right people are at the table. Uh, we're not meeting just to meet, but that we're actually making systemic change and finding ways that we can actually make um, the community more um, dementia friendly. And then of course, citizen engagement, we think is noteworthy. Uh, it is very important. And I think Ryan alluded to it earlier, um, hearing from those that we're trying to, um, to help. And we wanna hear from those people in the community. We wanna know from the citizens or the residents, um, those caregivers who are actually um, living this, right? And, and caring for someone with dementia. Uh, we need to hear what they see, their, their perspective, what they want. Um, and that's really a key, another key component of making sure that they're in attendance um, at these um, task force. Next slide, please. And so one of the things we thought was really exciting, uh, uh, well, actually it started out as <laughs> a, a big barrier. We were supposed to have our first Dementia Resource Expo and it was gonna be um, at the college actually in Ocala, the community, uh, the, the um, college in uh, Cali, I can't remember the exact name of it, but anyways, we were going to have a big um, in-person expo and had a lot of sponsors and we're ready to kind of kick it off. And it was really the second week of March, I believe. And I kind of remember thinking, oh my gosh, should we do it? Should we not do it? Uh, this was right when the pandemic was hitting and we decided that no, we needed, to, we needed to put it on hold. And we thought, can we do it virtually? And we did, we, we were really excited. We um, ended up, and this is just a screenshot here of the website, but you'll see the website down there at the bottom, dementiaresourceexpo.org. Um, we decided, well, we're gonna try to do this virtually. And it went over very, very well. Uh, it didn't happen until October of 2020, so it did take a while for us to, to get it in the virtual environment, but we really had um, over 30 partners and presenters that um, were involved. And what we really liked about it was that we were able to kind of video everything and then have those videos available, right, and streaming and all in the future. So if somebody wasn't able to attend, they could go back um, and see an archive of the videos. And we thought that was um, a really uh, nice component and benefit. We've kept this um, website and we do plan to continue to do virtual dementia resource expos so we can reach caregivers who might otherwise not be able to go to an in-person event. Um, next slide, please. 
And so kind of just winding it up, this is a last another screenshot of um, the, the Resource Expo website. It shows some of the sponsors, some of the people we worked with. Um, really overall, we've just been very pleased that our Dementia Care and Care Initiative has been able to thrive in the virtual environment. We haven't lost attendance. We've gained some partners. We've really been able to expand our training um, and that we have this new virtual way to reach um, caregivers through this expo. Again, we'll go back to doing some in-person, but keep the virtual aspect. Um, and we really just felt like, you know, these, again, to going back to the age-friendly initiative and the dementia care and care initiative, just how important that those are, that they work and complement of each other. Um, I wanna thank you again for inviting me to come speak about um, our D dementia care and care initiative, DCCI. But I really look forward to hearing from Jennifer Martinez um, from Marrying Senior Services, and then her and I being able to answer any questions that you may have um, on the work we're doing in North Central Florida. And so with that, um, I will turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Kristen. I really appreciate it. And as a reminder to everybody, uh, you can put your questions in the Q&A chat. And after we hear from Jennifer Martinez, we will open up a time to do some poll questions and then bring back Jennifer and Kristen and Kathy uh, to have a discussion again. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you for joining us, Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer Martinez is the Executive Director for Marion Senior Services. Thanks. Go ahead, hey, Jennifer. Good morning, everyone. I am honored to join this panel, as everybody else has said. Um, Marion Senior Services is the lead agency in Marion County for Elder Affairs. We are also the Community Transportation Coordinator and the Paratransit Public Transportation Provider for the entire county. We joined uh, the Age Friendly Network a couple of years ago, but the mindset and the initiative behind it is why I was asked to participate today. We're kind of the newer kid on the block um, into the age friendly network and just wanted to share some perspective and encouragement for those of you who might be considering joining the network. Next slide, please. Marion Senior Services, as the lead agency in Marion County, we are also the adult protective service arm for DCF. We have a lot of seniors and families um, arrive to our door in crisis sometimes, um, you know, waiting to ask for help. We've been trying to encourage folks to, um, you know, asking for help isn't a sign of weakness, it's a sign of strength. Encouraging families to reach out and get resources sooner than later. Um, it's not just our agency that this affects, it's not just the aging network, it's our society as a whole. And I think that's why we were so drawn to the age-friendly designation. Um, a little bit about Marion County. We have close to 400,000 residents. A little over a third of those folks are our greater generations. Uh, we cover about 1,600 square miles. So um, to put it into perspective, we are larger than the state of Rhode Island. We are smack dab in the middle of Florida. So we are at the heart of Florida. We're also the horse capital of the world. Um, very diverse backyard. We've got springs, we've got rivers, we've got land bridges, trails, anything you name it. Um, our equine, like I said, the uh, horse capital of the world, we just um, opened our World Equestrian Center. Our arts community is thriving with the Riley Art Center and our symphony um, and the many artists that participate in, in all that we have for them um, in that realm. So very diverse county and city and population. So when we started thinking about how we could become um, more proactive in our approach and before we learned of the age friendly, we started with a, the art of aging. Laura, can you turn to the next slide, please? The Art of Aging was actually initially a special project by a high schooler um, that was prior to me coming onto the agency. She took pictures of, oh, I think we got, thank you. Um, she took pictures of our clients and captured their beauty. We have so many greater generations that have stories to tell and hopes and dreams and she captured them in pictures and I thought that we could build on that. So we reached out to the Marian Cultural Alliance and pitched the art of aging and we built on that high schooler's idea. 
and partnered with a local photographer, Ralph D'Amelio, to capture our greater generations. The picture on the left is of a gentleman holding uh, his wife's pictures. And that was the focal point of our very first Art of Aging exhibit back in 2017. And then the bright young lady on the right hand side, Miss Barbara, she was one of the first commercial uh, airline, female airline pilots in the United States, uh, in Chicago, I believe. And the stories that she tells are incredible. And this um, past year, we were able to work with our local Ocala airport and was able to get her onto a plane. Um, and that was very, very fun. But it captures the art of aging. There is an art to aging. And throughout the entire month, um, the exhibit hall is filled with art from seniors in our community. We have the amazing photography of Rob D'Amelio capturing some of our greater generations throughout the, the, uh, the walls. And then we coupled it with uh, educational and lunch and learns. So promoting healthy aging. Also in 2017, uh, we kicked off our Communities for a Lifetime, our Senior Leadership Summit, and that's when I met, at the time, um, Depo Deputy Secretary Richard Prudham. Um, Laura, can you go to the next slide? Um, and we partnered with uh, many of our local leaderships. So Ken Colon on the far left-hand side is a visionary for our community. He and his family have established and have grown on top of the world. Um, Richard Prudham is there. We are also very fortunate to have Sheriff Woods uh, representative on our board and highly engaged in all that we do. I know Kristen mentioned our, our partnership and educational opportunities with DCCI. He's very committed to keeping our greater generation safe. Um, one thing that he has done in that realm is we invested in scent kits and not only scent kits, he coupled it with the ID bracelets. So in case a loved one wandered off, no matter whether it was by foot or in the car, um, we had some way of identifying and finding them. So highly committed to not just our seniors, but he also offered it to the children in our community too that kind of suffer in that same regard. So very, very committed. The other folks are um, other leadership within our community that really stepped up and got behind this mindset. So we had them speak and then we broke out into sessions. And some of the notes that were on there were to get to know your neighbors, really talking about community and, and what that means to them and how it can build their independence. Next slide, please. Just to give you an idea of the vision that Ken and On Top of the World have placed, um, some of the things that Ryan had mentioned and even Megan, you know, housing. He has been a visionary from the very beginning, um, really building the mindset of the household allowing you to age in place. But not only that, he um, really puts emphasis on exercising and maintaining movement. Uh, I've heard him say numerous times, you know, isolation is our biggest problem and our largest disease. So he really works on building the community, large exercise facilities, um, multiple housing groups, um, Right now, he's in the process of building a multi-generational complex, but I'm not going to share too much of that because I'm going to share more of that later. But he also has a master's of possibilities educational component to building not only the, the body, but also the mind and the spirit. So he's, he has been uh, a rock and a vision for me when, it started, when I started thinking about why Ocala Marion County should become age-friendly. Next slide, please, Laura. Again, just really putting people first, all ages, multi-generational, entry-level starter homes. He really thinks of it all, and it's all-encompassing. Next slide, please.
So some of, you know, these are some of the community aspects that are important to the residents. And when Ryan and Kristen and even Megan all talked about having to make sure, you know, you hear the voice of your community. He's very committed into hearing his residents and making sure that he is accommodating all of their needs at every level. So these are just some of the, the statistics for their community. Next slide, please. So both of those events started back in 2017, knowing that we wanted to do more um, and align. I think a lot of the key words that all of you have been saying is align and foundation and community. Calamari County has wonderful partnerships and wonderful leadership, and it is already well on its way. Um, in the age-friendly realm, but I think the platform itself has given us a formal way of introducing that. So when you look at Ocala and you look at Marion County and you look at all the partners, um, we really wanted to recognize what we are currently doing and then continue building on that aspect and building on the proactive approach to not only seniors, but children as well. Um, when I think about the age-friendly network and the way that I've described it is if you set up your community to serve children and seniors, everything else falls into place. When you look at the different livability domains and how we approach public health, it just makes common, it's common sense. So the designation, we received it in spring of 2019, and we just acknowledge the strengths and we are building on that foundation, like I said. Next slide please. Ryan mentioned, you know, partners lead. And when we were looking across the board um, on who we could bring to the table with us, um, I looked at the folks that already were implementing different age-friendly practices and ideas. And this uh, quote is all encompassing from our community to our team within the agency. We have incredible leadership within our agency that brings bright ideas to the table on a daily basis. And Kristen did allude to some of our human services and um, our dementia friendly initiatives. Um, Ryan, you mentioned, you know, how vital your para, or not paratransit, but your paramedicine program has been. Um, and we're on the same path as that doing a, possibly a co-responder program, but again, more on that later, but the bigger the dream, the more important the team. I reached out to city officials, um, our, our county officials, our public health, our department of health, um, our hospitals, anything and everyone that align Children's Alliance, trying to bring all the right people to the table to make sure that we had all of the information that we could possibly utilize um, as we move forward. We were the first um, in the state to do it and receive the designation as a city and a county together. I felt that that was very important and sent a very strong message of community and teamwork because as we work together, things just align better. I think that's what um, somebody else has said also. Next slide, please. I think something else that really compelled uh, our agency to, to focus on the age-friendly network is because it's community-driven. And having the right partners, like everyone else has said, has made it key. Um, and asking those right partners, the right partners started coming to us as uh, we shared the initiative of this work. We're very fortunate in our state to have leadership that's accessible for, for questions and more can well, Kathy Black, I mean, so encouraging, um, even on the state level with Secretary Prudom and even our state director for AARP, Jeff Johnson, very accessible, very encouraging um, in every aspect. When you have a question, when you wanna do something, they encourage you to shoot for, shoot for the stars. So having that mindset and having that encouragement has been very beneficial for us. I think, you know, something else that I um, 
I want to really reemphasize is the community aspect of it. Um, the age friendly platform and the age friendly network is it's in my opinion at a grassroots level. And when you think about your community, um, you know, the foundation of community is just being human, right? Um, having that connection with each other, having um, community ties. We're not strangers. We have relationships with each other. And I think that's where the magic really happens in your community that you can pick up the phone and you can call your county commissioner or your mayor or your sheriff or the secretary of the Department of Elder Affairs um, and really ask those questions and collaborate and you share and you support each other. And I think, again, going back to that grassroots effort, it really belongs in that leadership and building that leadership from the ground up. It also um, it empowers you locally, right? Because you drive your initiative, you drive your plan. You have government participation, so they have buy-in, um, both on your city and your county levels, which also brings greater accountability and responsibility to you, but it enhances your local capacity and building on those partnerships and really aligning those um, projects and processes that you're currently already doing in a more formal platform, um, highly beneficial. So again, community driven, um, having that sense of home, sense of family, shared identity, we're together in all of this. So I think, you know, we haven't really gotten much done since 2019 and our designation, we have implemented our current, uh, our survey. Next slide, Laura, please. Uh, and we really tried to get as much input as we possibly could. We're in the process of forming our our committee and looking at those survey results, looking at what other communities have been doing uh, through the network, because that's another perk of being a part of the network is going in and really looking at what others are doing and what you could do uh, yourselves. Um, and just building from there, I, I just, I really want to encourage all of you that if you haven't participated or haven't been involved or, or are thinking of doing so, please uh, reach out to um, myself or any of the other local leaders and uh, get going because it's a great initiative. So thank you. thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I really appreciate it. And I just wanna to highlight what uh, Jennifer did say. It was really exciting when Ocala and Marion joined as a joint city county. It's the first that first and the only one actually that we have in Florida right now um, where the city and the county are both working together. So that that is really exciting. We're seeing all sorts of different models popping up across the network um, of age-friendly communities. I had a question uh, about how are we doing enrollment? How can you find out more information? Uh, we are going to, as a reminder, this is being recorded live. We also are going to send out a PDF of the PowerPoint with links. We at ARP have a website that has a lot of information about um, the communities that are part of the network. Uh, nationally, we have over 566 communities and they're all doing this in different models. Uh, we have six states, one territory. Florida was the first fourth state to join uh, with Livable Florida that's being led by Secretary Prudhomme at the Department of Elder Affairs. So there's also information there too. So Jennifer and Kristen, um, if you wouldn't mind, there are some questions, just look in the chats. And as we do that, I'm going to ask everybody to pull back out their, um, their cell phones or their webpage. And we have two more poll questions and then I'm gonna invite Kathy to join us again for a discussion with the panelists. So while we're doing the poll, if there is something that you wanna ask um, Jennifer and Kristen, uh, please put that in the Q&A for us. Thank you. All right. Um, so. so the one, I see one directed at me, Jennifer on the right partners for city county. Just curious, did it turn any partners away that asked? Um, 
I don't believe that I did. Um, uh, I really, everybody that we did ask or consider, I think we wanted to build a win-win for everyone. Um, I'm trying to remember because it was so, so long ago, but I don't think that we had to turn anybody away, uh, for any reason. Thank you. Can, can I just pipe in here, everybody? Um, I think, uh, first of all, Jennifer and um, Kristen, two aging network leaders who are really uh, living and uh, really heart, heart and soul uh, this work, uh, so appreciated. And, uh, you know, as age friendly communities, everybody's a stakeholder. You saw the collaboration. It takes a village. And so it's really up to us to create those on ramps and pathways for everybody who wants to contribute in the ways that they can. And so Jennifer, thank you for not turning anybody away. And thank you. And we're, I'm gonna close out this poll now. It looks like a lot of people here are familiar with DCCI. If you aren't, um, if you're not familiar with it, you can find out more information at Elder Affairs um, to find out which DCCI programs are existing throughout the state. Um, and then I'm gonna turn to our next poll. So give it a second on your phone. It takes a minute to refresh. And one in one word, what does a dementia-friendly community look like to you? And I'm gonna leave this up in the background, Kathy, while uh, you and Jennifer and Kristen um, chat. And if you have any other questions that uh, you want to ask, please put that in the um, Q&A and we'll ask during this time too. Well, I wanted to respond, oh, I love this inclusive caring. Um, uh, Kristen, uh, there, there were, as about a third of the respondents uh, said that they're interested in dementia-friendly uh, communities. Any suggestions on where they would start uh, to look at that for their communities? I think Kristen is having some technical issues. Um, Go ahead and take that one, Jennifer. <laughs> can you repeat it? Because I was I was reading hers. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> um, for for people who are interested in their community uh, starting a dementia uh, care and cure initiative, dementia friendly community, what recommendations would you make for them? I would reach out to the aging network. Uh, and their DCCI directly. As Kristen kind of alluded, we're looking at the different models and how it would um, best suit Marion County. You know, having Shans and having Kristen and Alachua County so close, uh, highly beneficial for us. Um, but really looking at how it could best suit Marion County, it might not be um, in the, in the same way. So I, I would say just reach out to your DCCI or even your lead agency or service provider. Um, I know the Department of Elder Affairs has multiple links up on their on their website as well, but reach out to the, you know, your aging network locally. Uh, excellent advice. Your aging network will be a great source to start looking at how to uh, form one in your community. We would like to see every community age friendly and every community dem dementia friendly. And as we're looking at this word cloud in front of us, we're seeing a lot of words, diversity, ethnicity. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reality is uh, dementia impacts uh, uh, people of color. Uh, and uh, at dis there, there are great disparities. And uh, one of the questions we received was how can the Office of Equity, I'm assuming that that was the DOH uh, Office of Equity uh, participate and help our age-friendly community movement. And uh, many of the communities will be looking at focusing on, uh, you know, disparities among groups and, uh, you know, high-risk groups, et cetera. And so um, uh, please uh, connect with, well, your, your DOH is gonna be your great source there to connect with because they're also going to be very focused on, uh, you know, making a difference in, uh, in, in some of those disparities. Mm -hmm. Is, is uh, Kristen, Kristen, are you back on? Yes, Kristen's yes, back. I apologize, I apologize. Yeah. Uh, what happened, but um, 
Anyways, it kicked me off and I'm back on. So sorry about that. Glad to have you back on. Kristen, uh, uh, the, while you were gone, uh, the, the question was, there was some communities who were interested in dementia, starting dementia friendly. But actually I'm gonna throw the, the equity one to you as well. Um, any suggestions on uh, your work with DOH on equity for the, uh, for the age friendly movement? Well, yeah, actually, it's interesting you say that we, um, and, and this goes back to more for the age friendly when we were getting that going in Alachua County, we started with our survey kind of where Jenny's at right now. And we got the um, results back and we were realizing that we were not, we were not getting the portion of gains. We were not getting a diverse response right across the county. It was not getting to into the rural areas and pockets of the county. It also wasn't getting over to the east side into the you know, more of the minority community. So we said, okay, we've got to expand this and we've got to find um, better ways to get out and participate and get into those communities so that we can hear from them. Uh, we ended up with well over 500 responses for the county of Alachua, which we thought was good. And we got lots of diversity in that. So I would just say that if you don't get it in the first round, don't give up. You really got to get out into the community, connect with those in that community, find champions within those communities, um, in your rural pockets, in your rural areas, find somebody who is um, well-respected and trusted in that community and let them spread that word for you, get those surveys out um, and really kind of have them um, bring people to the table versus feeling like you've got to do it all. But um, so it's really identifying, I think that was mentioned earlier, champions, somebody who really believes in this and wants to um, be sure that you're getting, hearing from everyone's voices. Um, and then for the Dementia Care and Cure Initiative, the biggest thing I would definitely say is getting to um, caregivers um, at the table and again, do the same thing. If you're not seeing representation from um, the entire community, then you know find better ways to partner or find people who can help you and assist you with that. And you know, I think it's interesting how the word inclusive is still the largest word there. And it's so true of the age-friendly community movement, the age-friendly public health movement and uh, recognizing that it's about listening to people and that there's a whole bunch of circumstances, whether it's a rural setting or a socioeconomic status or gender or ethnicity, uh, veteran status, uh, a mental health status. There's a variety of things that all make us, uh, you know, uh, who we are um, and, and how do we meet the needs of all. And, and you know, just going back to Jennifer too, who really, really weaved in sort of this, uh, it's not just about needs and problems, but really about um, living, thriving, and really the positive, you know, arts and culture in aging and all people. And so um, Jennifer, any, any last thoughts for us there on, on other communities uh, really wrapping their arms around that so that, um, so that really, you know, aging is what it is like everything else in life. It's the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? But there's still a lot of good and opportunities. So, you know, like I said, it's the relationship and your partners. And I think that we've kind of all reiterated that and everything that we've said, it's really reaching out to the partners, you know, first responders, when I go back and I think about Sheriff Woods and our paramedicine and kind of what we're, where we're going in regards to dementia friendly, um, we added a social worker on, and like I said, you know, we're building on our co-responder team because we want to make sure that our first responders know how to approach our, our greater generations who might have to deal with some of these ailments with dementia. Um, but really just, like I said, build that, that partnership and the relationship that you have in your own community and make it a grassroots effort you're all working for the same purpose and you're all working for the common, the goal of better serving your community. So make sure that your voice is being heard to the right partners in your community. Uh, really, really great uh, words for us. And um, I, I, so I'm just wondering whether, uh, you know, where people are going to go from here and how we can continue this movement even uh, stronger. And I know that our, uh, in our last um, chat, someone had asked about texting and driving. And uh, of course we have a, a 
Gail Holly coming up in a future presentation, and they will be talking about, um, you know, uh, the enormous efforts being done across the state on those issues as well. And uh, uh, Laura, uh, yeah, we I, have, a, yeah, we have a question from Secretary Prudhomme as well. Go ahead, Secretary. It's not so much a uh, a question, um, but really um, just an observation, because. Uh, Obviously, it's been fascinating listening to the various presentations today, uh, but they all have a common thread, and um, it's it's all about community, and um, it's something that we we've all recognized is that this whole fr age friendly designation is a process that is and always will be you know community initiated and community driven, and that's what you've heard today. I mean, with with what was Ryan was talking about with the unique. Uh, challenges and opportunities in Walton County, and on obviously uh, with, with Kristen talking about uh, elder options in uh, in in, uh, in Gainesville and and that and the larger area, and then Jenna, Jenny was talking with what's in Carla and Marion County. You know, it's all community initiated and driven, and how they responded to that was how they viewed their uh, success uh, as, as enfolding and, you know, and, and, and coming to fruition. And, uh, that's, what's exciting about it is to listening to all these, uh, individual stories and how they garnered sort of support, uh, depending on the different communities that they, that they represent. So, and I think that's important to note is that as we embark on, uh, more communities becoming age friendly or even dementia friendly, um, you know, that, that neither the, the state or nor AARP is going to be dictating how, uh, that will occur. You know, we are very much going to be working with those communities to ensure they they achieve those goals that are, that are relevant and specific to the needs of that community. And, and and as Jenny said, it's a true grassroots effort in that regard. So I think that's something to take away as communities are listening to this and saying, well, how do we go about this? Yeah, reach out to Elder Affairs, reach out to AARP and, and ask, but don't be uh, worried about that we're going to dictate how you proceed. Uh, it's that is entirely up to you and we will facilitate we'll cheerlead um, uh, we'll encourage uh, but that's it you know really how this happens is up to you and I think that's the beauty of this is uh, and we saw that during the pandemic uh, you know the strength of the community comes through in, in responding to those uh, challenges that the pandemic placed upon us all and continues to place so that's it wasn't a question what is an observation about uh, how the power of community is the is, is the way to be successful in helping us all live and live well in the future. Thank you so much. That's uh, absolutely communities coming through in all of this. And I really appreciate uh, your remarks. And I think that's a great way to, to end this segment. Uh, it is definitely community driven. And I so appreciate hearing from everyone here. Um, I'm going to, uh, Jenny, Kristen, any last thoughts? No, I just, no, I, I'm happy to, uh, go ahead, Jenny. Sorry, just happy to talk and help and encourage and cheerlead as uh, Secretary Prudham said, the flexibility of this is truly on your shoulders and it can be as grand as you want it to be. And like I said, it's bringing the right people to the, to the table, aligning your passion and your purpose and just making your community stronger and better for it. And I would be remiss in saying, um, not saying or, or encouraging and supporting, and I can't even think of all the words that I want to say about Kristen right now. Um, as our AAA executive director, she's been a rock for us throughout the pandemic and throughout this designation and just how we lead Marion Senior Services. So thank you, Kristen. Well, I appreciate it, Jenny. And I, I, it's partners like you that make these initiatives fun to work on and also very successful. So I appreciate that. I think the support all the way from the administration at the state level to having really close local partnerships. And I agree local, 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 because um, Jenny and I talked the other day, what um, works in Gainesville is not even going to work in Ocala, it's not even going to work in, you know, um, Levy County, Williston, you know, it, it, so it's so diverse, but um, thank you for having me. And um, I've appreciated hearing from everyone today and being a part of this. Thank you. Thank you everybody so much for being a part of this today. Um, just a few more uh, slides uh, to let you know what's coming up. 
This is a uh, age-friendly sharing symposium series. We are recording the sessions, so they will be available to view later if you want to share them. Um, our next session will be September 30th, and that one's going to be also talking about a little bit of a different perspective, collaborating for age-friendly communities with resiliency. Uh, so we're going to be hearing from Kate Canaveral as one of our speakers talking about their resiliency plan and how that connects directly with the age-friendly work that they're doing. And then we're going to end the series on October 7th, uh, talking about advancing our age-friendly communities, bringing together some statewide partners to talk about resources that they have. And uh, during this time, AARP is having our national age-friendly conference, which will be on September 22nd and 23rd. Uh, talking specifically about what we heard today, communities and the role that communities and uh, community members and volunteers uh, can all play in age-friendly work. And as we end the session today, uh, I just wanted to end with a quick poll. Is there something you would like to know a little bit more about today's session um, that we can provide some resources for you? So if you have your phone, this is the last one. If you would pull it out, uh, and let us know. And I see community examples are coming up right away. Uh, and that is definitely uh, one of the most important things. And that's why we started this sharing symposium series uh, five, six years ago now, is to really hear from each other uh, so that we can see what pieces might work in our own community and resources, age-friendly public health. Great. All right, I'll just give it a few more minutes. Okay. And all of these poll questions, when we send out the PowerPoint deck, we will make sure to include the word clouds and the answers so that you have that information um, at the end. Okay. And as was mentioned, if you have any questions today or want any more information about Livable Florida Age Friendly, any of the work, uh, please feel free to email me at lcantwell at aarp.org. And you can also email Livable Florida at livablefl at elder affairs uh, as well. We have both of our information here. We will be sending that out in our PDF deck as well. And we will also be including a link to the version of this that will be saved uh, for you to view later or to share with others. So with that, I want to thank everybody so much for staying with us during this hour and thank a huge thank you to all of our presenters for sharing the wonderful work that you're doing in your community. Uh, we really thank your time um, that you put together to share this with us. And I look forward to seeing everybody else in our next series. Thank you so much.